I first uh, traveled to Central Eurasia in 1974, a date that for many of you must seem positively primordial. Uh, I had recently completed my undergraduate studies in Western music history and theory, and had received a Watson Travel Fellowship to support a year of Wanderlust, centered around a vaguely formulated project to investigate the relationship between music and language. I knew nothing about any kind of Eastern music and had no foreign language skills other than mediocre French and rudimentary Russian. When I left London, heading by train and bus for Afghanistan, an acquaintance had given me the name of John Bailey, who was then a young experimental psychologist in the process of transforming himself into an ethnomusicologist. John was said to be living in Herat and conducting pioneering fieldwork on Herati dutar players. I wrote John a letter asking whether I could visit him when I passed through Herat later in the month, and I dropped the letter in a mailbox somewhere in Istanbul. Not surprisingly, I never heard back from John, <laughs> and I never did find him when I passed briefly through Herat on my way to Kabul and then India. But even though I didn't meet him then, uh, John became a vicarious inspiration to me uh, through his deep immersion in the music and culture of Afghanistan. In the close to four decades since we almost crossed paths in Herat, I've learned a great deal from his books, articles, films, recordings, and advocacy efforts, and I'm delighted finally to catch up with him here in London after a long hiatus. In uh, 1974, even the most prescient and far-sighted observer of Central Asia would have been hard-pressed to imagine the region as it is today. Though a coup d'etat had recently deposed the longtime king of Afghanistan, Muhammad Zahir Shah, the country had remained stable following the coup. And with the Soviet Union under the firm rule of Leonid Brezhnev, the political boundaries of Soviet Central Asia seemed as permanent as the sun, moon, and stars. And yet, as all of us in this room know, these seemingly hardened boundaries belied the myriad discrepancies, ambiguities, and incongruities that characterize the vexed relationship between political boundaries and cultural continuities in the Soviet Union. By cultural continuities, I mean in the broadest sense, geographical continuities that reflect aspects of material, spiritual, and expressive culture, including language, literature, art, music, religion, cuisine, and so on. 20 years after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the political borders of the former Soviet republics, with a few notable exceptions, have remained stable. What's changed, of course, is not the political borders themselves, but the way that cultural continuities, as well as cultural boundaries, have been illuminated, valorized, and energized, both within the territory of the former Soviet Union and with respect to contiguous and historically related regions. The parties responsible for re-illuminating, revalorizing, and re-energizing these cultural continuities and boundaries include nation states and intragovernmental organizations such as UNESCO, as well as non-state actors. By non-state actors, I mean principally NGOs and private foundations, as well as a variety of advocacy groups and individuals acting on their own initiative. These diverse actors all have their own version of Central Eurasian geography. For some, this geography is expressed through patterns of political and economic activity or the routing of oil and natural gas pipelines. For others, it is expressed by drawing attention to linguistic, cultural, or religious markers. And for still others, it is expressed through the cultivation of values, beliefs, and practices that create conceptual, symbolic, or metaphoric connections between cultural, culture and society in Central Eurasia and in other parts of the world. Different means of expression notwithstanding, what these geographies all have in common is that they are constructs. That is, they do not simply map extant features of physical, social, or cultural landscapes. Rather, they are products of geographical imagination an attempt to map Central Eurasia not as it is, but as it might be 
in one or another version of a possible future. Needless to say, in Central Eurasia, as in any region of the world, there are many claimants to the future as well as to the past. Indeed, it is not surprising that in a region where tradition has played such an important role in social life, there should be an ongoing struggle for what you could call the future of the past. This struggle has engendered a wide spectrum of geographies, which at their extremes offer starkly different maps of Central Asian culture and society, both in the past and in the future. Music has played and continues to play a key role in reifying these alternative geographies. In the time remaining, I want to show you some of the ways music does that. Of the many possible geographies of Central Asia, I will speak about eight in which music is prominent. Taken together, these alternative geographies comprise what I call in the title of my talk, the geography of possibility. The first of these possible geographies is the geography of ethno-nationalism. About ethno-nationalism, I don't think I need to say much because its characteristics are well known to everyone in this room. In the domain of culture, the ideals of ethno-nationalism are crystallized in the notion of so-called national cultural heritage or cultural patrimony. Ethno-nationalist cultural heritage legitimates and aggrandizes the historical legacy and cultural achievement of a particular social group defined politically as constituting the titular nationality of a modern nation state, Turkmen in Turkmenistan, Tajiks in Tajikistan, Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, and so on. Its resources include history and mythology, or, as is often the case, a seamless amalgam of the two, as well as the construction and preservation of historical monuments, the publication of epic literature, the staging of ritualized festivals and celebrations, museum exhibitions, film, sculpture, architecture, and the canonization of performance traditions in music, theater, and dance that become icons of a constructed national identity. These days, it also includes computer games. A recent article in the Times of Central Asia reported on the creation of a new computer games academy in Uzbekistan run by the State Agency of Communications and Informatics. The agency announced that, among other things, the new academy will develop, quote, socially important national computer games, end quote. <laughs> Ethno-nationalism remains the preeminent form of musical geography in the five post-Soviet nations of Central Asia, where, to varying degrees, it is reinforced and reified by national cultural policy. In the domain of music and other forms of expressive culture, a close corollary of ethno-nationalism is state-sponsored multiculturalism. Though at first glance, ethno-nationalism and multiculturalism may seem like polar opposites, they arise from one and the same cultural politics. These cultural politics rest on the presumption that social groups defined by ethnicity should be carriers of a cultural heritage that reflects their ethnogenesis and is rooted in a stable and coherent tradition. The musical geography of multiculturalism was exemplified by Soviet nationalities policies and its mandate to develop music and other art forms that were nationalist in form and socialist in content. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, the torch of Eurasian multiculturalism passed to China. With its 56 official nationalities, 55 of them minorities, China has been aggressively advancing its own version of a multicultural musical geography that legitimizes the model of officially sanctioned national art forms for all minority groups. For better, and I'm afraid for worse, China's efforts in this regard have been aided by UNESCO's Intangible Cultural Heritage Program. And Carol Pegg has already spoken about a case involving China's Mongolian minority. A similar case occurred in 2009 when the government of China nominated the Kyrgyz epic Manas for inscription in UNESCO's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity as, quote, one of the three major epics of China, end quote. China justified the nomination on the basis of a small ethnic Kyrgyz population 
uh, that resides in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And you can see it there. there the Kyrgyz are, are right along the border there of Kyrgyzstan and China. China has been one of the most active countries in submitting nominations for inscription in UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage lists, as has already been pointed out today. Uh, China's strategy in pursuing these nominations seems to be twofold. First, many of the nominations promote the cultural heritage of the Han ethnic group, which is by far the largest of the 56 ethnic groups officially recognized in China. Second, an almost equal number of nominations promote the cultural heritage of minority ethnic groups. In addition to the Manas epic and Mongolian throat singing, recent inscriptions include the Gesar epic tradition representing Tibetans and Uyghur Mashrap, the traditional form of festivity that's been a central element of expressive culture among the Uyghurs. China's nomination of the Kyrgyz Manas provoked hysteria in Kyrgyzstan over the issue of cultural property rights. For its part, Kyrgyzstan has mounted a campaign to force UNESCO to rescind the China-driven inscription of Manas in, the, in its representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And this year, Kyrgyzstan is nominating Manas itself. Hostilities over heritage notwithstanding, the short video film that China submitted as part of its UNESCO nomination materials offers a telling example of the geography of multiculturalism as it's currently playing out in China. Here's the beginning of the film. The Kyrgyz people who live in the mountain areas of southern and northern Tianshan and the Palmy area in Xinjiang, China, have a long history and nomadic tradition. The Kyrgyz have been nurtured generations after generations by the epic Manas, an oral epic which have been singing for a thousand years. Today, the Kyrgyz rely mainly on animal husbandry, agriculture, and handicraft industry. Kyrgyz women are especially skillful in embroidering felt rugs. The Kyrgyz love grasslands as well as their hero Manas, and are proud to be his descendants even now. Manas is a living epic. Wherever there are Kyrgyzians, there are songs of Manas. Although sometimes accompanied by a kind of instrument called commons, most performances of Manas are merely singing, with one or several singers. After work, during family reunions, or large gatherings of hundreds or thousands of persons for weddings, ceremonies and festivals, people gather together, excitedly and cheerfully, singing and listening to the heroic epic manas throughout the night. Even if China is blatantly using UNESCO's intangible heritage convention for its own political purposes, that is, to legitimize its carefully constructed nationalities policies, and the role of national minorities in a multicultural state, Kyrgyzstan's very strong negative reaction to the Manas nomination is surely motivated by a reflex of ethno-nationalist protectionism 
that seems misplaced in a cosmopolitan world. If ethno-nationalism and multiculturalism are the prevailing models that shape state-sponsored cultural uh, geography in Central Eurasia, then other geographies represent an effort to challenge the domination of these models. These alternative geographies typically reflect the mission, values, and strategy of non-state actors, which is to say international NGOs and foundations as a part of their own vision of Central Eurasian geography. In this vision, ideologies of nationalism play a limited role in the cultural sector, while Central Asia is linked to the West by the assimilation of democratic values and the rule of law, the growth of civil society and social tolerance, and the cultivation of neoliberal economic policies. The investments and strategies that Western NGOs hope will transform the social, political, and economic geography of Central Asia are supported by parallel investments and strategies that aim to transform the region's cultural geography. If you examine the initiatives of these NGOs, as well as the initiatives of other non-state actors in the region, they coalesce around several different but related geographic visions. The first of these is what I'd call the geography of cosmopolitanism. Put simply, the geography of cosmopolitanism seeks to connect the local to the global. With respect to art, it strives to provide a target population with broad democratic access to the artistic achievements of other cultures. It does this both by building an appreciation of these achievements in the general population and by supporting talented artists and musicians in their explorations of non-indigenous artistic practices, typically those rooted in European civilization. The contrast between ethno-nationalism and cosmopolitanism as frameworks for creating and interpreting art was eloquently expressed by philosopher Anthony Appia in his book Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, published in 2006. Appiah wrote, quote, the connection people feel to cultural objects that are symbolically theirs because they were produced from within a world of meaning created by their ancestors, that is, the connection to art through identity, is powerful. It should be acknowledged. The cosmopolitan, though, wants to remind us of other connections. One connection, the one neglected in talk of cultural patrimony, is the connection not through identity, but despite difference. We can respond to art that is not ours. Indeed, we can fully respond to our art only if we move beyond thinking of it as ours and start to, res and start to respond to it as art." End quote. In short, cosmopolitanism is the antithesis of ethno-nationalism, and international NGOs view the development of cosmopolitanism in the education and culture sectors as a key priority in carrying out their agendas for transformational social change. There are many current examples of initiatives to cosmopolitanize Central Asian culture. One of them is Bishkek's International Jazz Festival, which has been supported by the Swiss Development Corporation, the Open Society Foundations, better known as the Soros Foundation, the Christensen Fund, and various European embassies. Another cosmopolitan initiative is the Didor International Film Festival in Tajikistan, supported by the Open Society Foundations, Swiss Development Corporation, and HIVOS, the Humanist Institute for Development uh, Corporation based in the Netherlands. Still another example is a new Central Asian youth orchestra that is being organized by the Italian development organization CESVI, which received a grant of close to 400,000 euros from the European Union for this project. Chesvi's project brochure describes its aim as follows, quote, to contribute to the development and promotion of traditional and classical music in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan by strengthening regional cooperation, integration, and European networking, end quote. Other cosmopolitan arts projects have an explicit social or political agenda. For example, Kyrgyzstan's Human Rights Documentary Film Festival, which was established as an activity of the Czech NGO People in Need and is supported by the European Union, the Open Society Foundations, and other international donors. 
Another such example is the recent, recent dance festival in Dushanbe, organized by the United States Embassy, in which choreographers assisted students in creating dances that represent the harmful nature of drug use and successful battles against drug addiction. And still another example is a project of the Brussels-based NGO Jeunesse Musicale called Fair Play, which involves a global music video competition for original songs by young bands on the theme of anti-corruption. The three best scoring bands will win a trip to Brazil to participate in a Voices Against Corruption forum and perform live in Brasilia. Alongside these large initiatives are a host of smaller projects, including quite a few in music, that have been supported by international NGOs with the aim of broadening and deepening the geography of cosmopolitanism. One that I've helped to nurture in my capacity as chair of the Arts and Culture Program of the Open Society Foundations is a project organized by the New York-based NGO CEC ArtsLink to send young Central Asian musicians to New York City to participate in a summer composition and performance workshop offered by the contemporary music ensemble Bang on a Can. Three summers ago, one of the participants was 22-year-old uh, Kambar Kalandarov from Bishkek. Kambar plays several Kyrgyz instruments, including Shor, Tamir Komuz, and Jirach Komuz. He had taken composition lessons in Bishkek for one year and could read and write Western music notation, but had little knowledge of contemporary music from the West. During the workshop with Bang on a Can, Kambar was first exposed to American minimalism and first heard the music of Steve Reich, Philip Glass, and Terry Riley. Returning to Bishkek, Kambar composed a piece for metal and wooden Jews harps, Chor, the Kyrgyz Enblown Flute, and percussion, called Echo of Time. Though Echo of Time uses only Kyrgyz traditional instruments, the style of the music is utterly non-traditional, and the influence of minimalism is strongly apparent. In fact, for Kambar, composing a contemporary-sounding minimalist piece wasn't such a stretch, because he intuitively understood the connection between the slowly shifting rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic patterns in the works of American minimalists and the permutation and recombination of short melodic patterns that is common in the instrumental coup repertoire of Kyrgyz music. Last spring, Bang on a Can released uh, Kambar's Echo of Time on a new CD on their Cantaloupe music label called Jaw. Here's the CD. You can order it online. And here's the beginning of uh, Kambar's piece, Echoes of Time, Echo of Time. <laughs> Time represents a huge achievement for what you could call contemporary tradition-based music in Kyrgyzstan. What I mean by tradition-based is that the music is rooted in but not constrained by tradition. For me, it epitomizes a way to conceive the future of the past in music that offers a stark alternative to the frozen-in-time cultural heritage template backed by state cultural organizations often with the support of UNESCO. At its best, such music can play a subtly subversive role in challenging the cultural status quo and offers a glimpse of the rich resources 
that tradition provides as a source for cosmopolitan musical creativity and innovation. These days, talented young musicians in Bishkek can learn the kinds of musical skills that will enable them to engage in cosmopolitan music projects by attending classes at Center Ustad Shakirt, a local NGO supported by the Aga Khan Music Initiative and in part by the San Francisco-based Christensen Fund. Students at Ustad Shakirt who come there after their regular school days and on weekends learn to use the Finale computer program for music notation and notate their own tradition-based arrangements and compositions on a new Macintosh computer donated by the American Embassy. They also take English conversation classes since the Ustad Shakirt leadership views knowledge of English as a crucial skill for aspiring cosmopolitan musicians. There are a couple of those uh, students in Bishkek. The students also perform together in an ensemble led by Center Ustad Shakirt's artistic director, Nurlandek Nishana. Some of the pieces they play are Nishanov's own compositions, while others are Nishanov's neo-traditional arrangements of pieces by other composers working in the genre of Kyrgyz Ku. Here's an example of the Ustad Shakirt ensemble performing a medley of three of Nishanov's compositions for metal and wooden Jews harps, komus, kilkiak, chopachor, and chor. While I don't want to sound too categorical, to my eye and ear, there's a world of difference between the interactivity, informality, and free-spirited joy that's evident in the performance of this group of Kyrgyz teenagers and the tautly choreographed, and I'm sorry to say, often quite soulless performances typical of folk music ensembles groomed within the state-sponsored music education establishment. Another of the new musical geographies that's become becoming established in Central Asia is what I would call the geography of hybridity. For proponents of this geography, the aim is similar to the geography of cosmopolitanism, but the manner in which it constructs cross-cultural connections is different. Hybridity, whether in art, religion, or genealogy, is intrinsically the enemy of politicized constructions of national cultural heritage. These constructions favor linear historical trajectories that seamlessly link past and present and point confidently toward a future of stable congruence between nation-centered identities and cultural practices glossed as national, or in the case of China and other ethnically diverse nations, as the practices of national minorities. In art, national cultural heritage favors tidy taxonomies of style, form, and genre that classify and canonize the representation of culture 
whether tangible or intangible. By contrast, hybrid work that crosses cultural categories and artistic genres challenges linearity and canonicity. For artists from nations where expressive culture has been co-opted by ethno-nationalist constructions of cultural heritage, tradition-based hybrid art points to the possibility of alternative cultural genealogies that can challenge official narratives of cultural history and cultural development. Over the last decade, I've been involved in several projects to seed and cultivate various forms of artistic hybridity involving musicians from Central Eurasia. One of these is connected to the great Azerbaijani vocalist Alim Kasimov and his daughter Fergana Kasimova. My most recent project with the Kasimovs centers around a creative collaboration with the Kronos Quartet, conducted under the aegis of the Aga Khan Music Initiative. In this collaboration, Alim Kasimov sent his own arrangements of several Azerbaijani traditional popular songs to Kronos, which hired an arranger to score the songs for string quartet. Alim and two members of his ensemble subsequently traveled to San Francisco to rehearse the newly arranged songs with the Kronos Quartet. The challenge of the week-long rehearsal period was to create a seamless interface between the note-reading Kronos players and the Kasimov ensemble, whose performances typically feature an ever-shifting blend of memorized and extemporized musical genres, excuse me, musical gestures. For me, the interest of watching the collaboration unfold was the way it challenged all the participants to go beyond their zone of safety in search of a musical lingua franca through which to communicate. Here's a brief video clip edited together from the footage filmed during the week-long rehearsal period for the project. He'll, he'll show you. Why don't you start from the beginning? It was about 15 years ago when a, f a friend of mine introduced me to the music of Alim. I, I realized immediately that there was a quality there that I'd never heard before from the Biz ağacları əkdik, çiçəkləri əkdik. İndi onun bar verməsi 
Yani yine olarla bizden hastalıyor. Gözlerin aldığına Kemende On the surface, this kind of musical hybridity may look like a retake of the Soviet-era Europeanization of indigenous Eurasian musical traditions. But I would argue that it is different this time around. No one is forcing European instruments on local artists or ordering them to alter their own instruments in order to play an equal temperament. On the contrary, there's an attempt on the part of the organizers of this collaboration to level the playing field so that the players meet halfway. The question is, can traditional place-specific music, such as Azerbaijani popular song, be exported? Can such music be hybridized and cosmopolitanized without losing the artistic energy that makes it powerful? The jury is still out, but this is an aspiration. Another new musical geography of Central Asia links the region not so much to artistic culture in the West as to other regions with which Central Asia historically had strong links, namely China, India, Iran, and the Middle East. I would call this new geography the musical geography of revitalized interregionalism. In fact, this musical geography is not completely new, for in the Soviet era, as I remember from my own days at the Tashkent Conservatory in the 1970s, cultural exchanges with India and with Arab countries were not uncommon. Such exchanges, however, overwhelmingly represented political symbolism rather than musical substance, and to the best of my knowledge, they never led to ongoing artistic collaborations between musicians from the countries involved. In the post-Soviet era, individual Central Asian nations have to some extent continued these exchanges, again more on the level of symbolism than substance, perhaps most actively Tajikistan, which has had an episodic musical dialogue with Iran. Cultural contacts between Iran and Tajikistan are likely to grow stronger in years ahead as the two countries develop plans for a pipeline to deliver natural gas from Iran to Tajikistan, as well as to Kyrgyzstan and China. The symbolic role of arts and culture, the so-called soft power of international diplomacy, in articulating political alliances or signaling political intentions remains an important one. Yet, the artists cast in this highly visible role tend to be drawn from the center of a nation's artistic life rather than from its margins and peripheries where new and experimental work is most often seeded and nourished. In the case of Central Asia, it is again the NGO sector that has taken the lead in linking adventurous musicians with their counterparts in contiguous regions. Within the NGO sector, the most active organization in this domain has been the Aga Khan Music Initiative, known by its acronym, ACMI. ACMI was formerly ACMICA, the Aga Khan Music Initiative in Central Asia, but in light of the program's expanding interregional geography, we've dropped the COT. Uh, a, a description of ACMI's mission and activities is available on its website, but let me summarize here. The music initiative was launched in 2000 by His Highness the Aga Khan to support talented musicians and music educators striving to preserve, transmit, and further develop their musical heritage. ACMI's present uh, projects and activities focus on reanimating historical connections and nurturing creative collaborations among musicians from Central Asia, South Asia, China, the Middle East, and North Africa, who are working to reassemble diverse expressions of a shared musical heritage in contemporary forms. ACMI helps to disseminate the results of these musicians' work through a global network of partnerships with educational institutions, art presenters, and music distributors. And as you heard this morning, one of these partnering institutions is SOAS. A recent ACMI project aimed to illuminate historical musical links between Central Asia and China by bringing together musicians from Tajikistan and from Xinjiang with Chinese pipa player Wu Man. The music they created together 
underscores the Central Asian origins of the pipa. Here's a short excerpt from a video of the collaboration. The full video appears in the CD-DVD release Borderlands, Wuman with master musicians from the Silk Road, which comprises volume 10 of the CD-DVD anthology, Music of Central Asia. This is coming out in uh, two weeks, formally, and it's the last one of our 10-part series. Thank God. Uh, and here's uh, the uh, excerpt from the film. جمعوری ما هنرمندان از اون عبارت است که با هم یک نوازش های کنیم ببینیم تا چه اندازه موقع موسیقی توجیک و موسیقی خیطای با هم پیوست است In the historical side, pipa actually came from Central Asia 2,000 years ago. Through the Silk Road trade, the tonality and the musical language, the vocabulary right now developed very much Chinese. In the past few days, we were with you in this period of time. یک سه چهار اثر را با هم ایجاد سازیم یکی از اثرها این بود بستگی با پیپا با ستا در پرده نوا نوای ماکی آنها پرده اصلا دیگر دارند لیکن ببینید که برابر من یک بداحتا یک چیز نواخت و آن نالیش و گردیش های موسیقی خطای بود لیکن در برابر آن باز موسیقی پرده نوا را احساس میکرد If you go back, like this time, I played with Siraj and Abdul Wali, we found out very, very common, actually, the tune, the color, um, the sound of the instrument. pieces we played it together, uh, they all remarkable to me, especially one Chinese tomb I wasn't expect. I feel very fortunate as a musician. I didn't dream to have this opportunity. It's kind of like a dream come true.
The Borderlands CD DVD release will be followed by worldwide concert and festival appearances of the musicians involved. In this way, what began as a mere idea about revitalizing a historic musical connection will achieve actuality and hopefully provide listeners in Central Asia, China, and around the world with a fresh, fresh example of historical cultural connectivity coming newly alive. Another form of cultural revitalization that's particularly active in Kyrgyzstan, where I've been living since March, stems from what I'd call the geography of indigenous spirituality. This geography focuses on mapping the relationship between physical environment and manifestations of the spiritual, material, and expressive culture that plays such an important role in all nomadic or historically nomadic cultures. In Kyrgyzstan, the prime mover behind this kind of mapping is the Aigina Cultural Research Center, which has received extensive support from the San Francisco-based Christensen Fund. There's a um, slide of uh, some teachers, Kyrgyz music teachers, who are coming together at Aigina, uh, learning to play. Uh, uh, they already play the komus, but they're learning uh, the uh, style and repertoire of Nurak Abdrahmanov, who's one of the great uh, Kyrgyz uh, uh, players of, of komus. Aigina's website describes its mission as follows. One, studying and preserving natural, cultural legacy and diversity in Kyrgyzstan. Two, preserving, developing, and integrating traditional wisdom with contemporary life and aiming to incorporate the positive potential of traditional wisdom in decision-making at all levels of public and, uh, public and political life. Three, seeking points of rapprochement and interconnection among esoteric knowledge and science, nature and culture, traditions and innovations, West and East, and other experiences often seen as opposites. One of Aigina's recent projects is a 25-hour long video that presents 50 key episodes from the Manas epic recited by 12 contemporary Manas Chis. Smartly packaged and accompanied by a descriptive booklet, a thousand copies of the video are being distributed free of charge to schools across Kyrgyzstan. Aigina's founder and director, Gulnara Aipayeva, described to me how she understands the relationship between the Manas project and indigenous spirituality. Gulnara told me, for these 12 contemporary Manas Chis, the source of their energy and information is not only contemporary forms of knowledge, such as books, but most of all, the spiritual dimension, that is, the spirits who visit them and their memory, which works in ways that are not well understood. The connection between Manas Chis and the epic heroes they recite about is for them a real one. It takes place in dreams as well as during the day in apparitions in which the reciter sees and hears the epic hero. This connection is what allows Manas Chis to receive the kind of information that can touch large groups of people." End quote. For Gulnara, this social aspect of indigenous spirituality is key. Indigenous spirituality, she said, doesn't exist just for its own sake. Rather, its purpose is to recover and maintain the health and equilibrium of communities, societies, and nations. I showed Gunara the Manas video clip submitted for China's UNESCO Intangible Heritage nomination and asked if she'd be willing to comment on it. She said, quote, I have nothing against China nominating the Manas for UNESCO recognition. There are Kyrgyz living there, and China has a right to do this. But judging by what's shown in the video, they've taken out all the spirituality. What's left is just entertainment." End quote. Last month, Aigina organized a launch event in Bishkek for its Manas video project. The 12 Manas Chis, who range in age from quite young to quite old, took turns reciting the epic poem. The presentation took place in the large auditorium of the Saytek Youth Center, and there wasn't an empty seat in the house. Many young people came on their own, while others came with multi-generational families. Aigina, through its Manas project, is attempting to depoliticize the Manas and pro provide an alternative to the popular imagery of Manas as the archetypal warrior chieftain, qualities that are widely represented 
in images such as these taken from recent Kyrgyz publications. And you've already seen some of these uh, uh, earlier this morning. Aigina's mission to integrate traditional knowledge into contemporary life, resacralize landscape, and forge a stronger sense of place all offer a compelling counterpoise to the forms of ethno-nationalism. It's true, said Gulnara, that the narrative text of the Manas is filled with descriptions of battles to defend Kyrgyz territory and identity. But if you listen to the Manas as rhythm, as vibration, then there's no national delimitation and the universal human qualities of the epic come through. We're interested in both the verbal and nonverbal aspects of Manas' performance and how they can unite people, end quote. Gulnara recounted how, after the Ash riots of 2010, many Manas Chis went to the south to try to calm the tensions. There she heard about three Uzbek schools where young Uzbek students were learning to recite the Manas. For her, these young Uzbek Manas Chis offered confirmation of the Manas as a universal spiritual phenomenon that transcends the limitations of any single ethno-national identity or physical place. For people who have been displaced from their place of origin, having a sense of place can assume an even greater importance. Displacement also has its geographies, the geography of refugees and of labor, labor migrants, the geography of diaspora communities, the geography of exile. The history of Central Eurasia has produced its own fair share of displaced persons, and that history of displacement continues today. These days, geographies of displacement link Central Asia to points around the world. The links are economic, social, and cultural. Particularly in the case of diaspora communities, art, film, literature, and music provide the tissue of connectivity. Two diaspora communities in which music plays a key role in the geography of connectivity are the Afghan diaspora community in the United States centered in Fremont, California, and in Northern Virginia, and the Bukharan Jewish communities of Queens, New York, and Tel Aviv, Israel. It goes without saying that the musical geography of diaspora communities is a huge and important topic, and I'm delighted that it is figuring with increasing prominence in research by younger scholars, some of whom are participating in this conference. Diaspora communities have also been a target for NGOs and nonprofit organizations interested in preserving and sustaining traditional musical heritage. But from what I've observed, many of these communities are managing quite well with their own internal forms of patronage. For example, in the case of the Bukharan Jewish community in New York, this last January, at the initiative of a single influential cultural activist, the musicologist and newspaper editor, Raphael Niktalov, a concert was organized at Carnegie Hall that brought together local Bukharan Jewish musicians with the sons and grandson of the late Turgun Alimatov, the great Uzbek Dutar, Tanbur, and Satol player. Turgun Akha's sons and grandson are fine musicians in their own right, and they came specially from Uzbekistan for the Carnegie, for the Carnegie Hall event. The day after the concert, Rafael Niktalov organized a well-attended roundtable in the Bukharan Synagogue and Cultural Center in Queens to discuss the future of Shash Makam in the diaspora community. Whether Shash Makam can survive the inevitable assimilation of future generations of Bukharan Jews into mainstream American culture ought to be a priority question for musical geographers. Indeed, it is a burning question for Bukharan Jewish cultural activists. Finally, I would like to mention briefly a musical geography that, based on the description of papers in the conference booklet, is not going to be addressed comprehensively by any of us, but will be discussed in the context of, context of specific examples by the three final presenters, namely the geography of musical globalization. As another domain of the geography of possibility, a geography of musical globalization would imagine Central Eurasia as both a source and a market for the global flow of music. While one cannot exclude the possibility of a world in which recordings of Shash Makam or Karl Kopa Kobe's music would become global bestsellers, in our world, 
the global flow of music consists overwhelmingly of music conceived, produced, and marketed as a commercial commodity. The inflow of such music to Central Asia from Russia, Europe, North America, and South Asia is enormous. Here's an example of some of that inflow on a CD and DVD kiosk in Bishkek. By contrast, the outflow of music from Central Asia to the rest of the world is infinitesimally small. These days, it consists mainly of recordings and video clips by the occasional pop diva, such as Yulduz Usmanova or Severa Nazarkhan, and the rare CD of traditional music that receives symbolic recognition in the marketing category of world music. For example, the album Invisible Face of the Beloved, featuring Tajik musician Abduvali Abdurashidov and members of his Academy of Makam, which was released in the United States by Smithsonian Folkways Recordings and was nominated uh, for a Grammy Award. The geography of musical globalization is driven by a business model rather than, as in the case with geographies of cosmopolitanism or ethno-nationalism, by a social mission or political ideology. And while scholars devoted to the study of traditional music may dismiss the geography of musical globalization as unworthy of serious scholarly attention, we ignore it at our own peril. For quite obviously, the juggernaut of globalization dwarfs the impact of all other cultural geographies, whether promulgated by state, non-state, or intergovernmental actors. Though quite a few books and articles have been written about so-called global pop, None of them seem to have drawn much information from Central Asia, which still lies outside the main meridians of global musical commerce. To conclude, I want to offer a brief summary of the ideas I've presented and leave you with a few thoughts about our own role as music specialists in this world of multi-layered musical geographies. I presented you with short descriptions of eight different kinds of musical geography. I have called these the geography of ethno-nationalism, the geography of multiculturalism, of cosmopolitanism, of hybridity, of revitalized interregionalism, of indigenous spirituality, of diaspora, and of globalization. And while what I provided you in my talk was a series of descriptions, geography itself is, of course, not merely descriptive. Rather, it has agency. That is, it actively constructs and shapes culture. The particular way we as geographers of music imagine the world and the patterns of musical activity that inhabit it can have a profound impact on music itself. Just as physical geography changes over time as a consequence of the shifting of the Earth's tectonic plates and as a result of climate change, so cultural geography, including musical geography, changes as a result of shifts in political relations and social relations. How quickly this can happen was brought home to me during a recent visit, visit to Khojand in northern Tajikistan. There I spoke with musicians who told me how devastating the recent hardening of the border between Tajikistan and Uzbekistan has been for them. Musicians who used to cross the border freely to per perform at weddings on the Uzbek side have lost a source of livelihood. The formerly bilingual musical life of Khojand has become firmly monolingual, with Uzbek language songs considered undesirable in any kind of pu public performance situation. Sources in Uzbekistan tell me that the situation is analogous there. If this hardened border becomes permanent, it will surely create an ever-deepening schism between the musical repertoires and styles of the Uzbek and Tajik musicians who once shared the unified musical culture of the Fergana Valley. In the end, none of us in this room may be able to affect the decisions of autocratic leaders to harden national boundaries. Yet, as I hope I have demonstrated, there are many aspects of musical geography that we and people like us can affect. I believe that we bear a professional responsibility to help move the world toward more enlightened musical geographies. In these geographies, musical practices and preferences would represent a personal choice, not a necessity beholden to nationality, religion, language, lineage, ethnicity, or other inherited social markers. 
Let us reaffirm our commitment to working together with one another and with agents of social change and transformation to allow music in Central Eurasia to realize its full potential as a source of artistic, spiritual, and geographical imagination in our globalized world. Thank you.